Hey, welcome to PC Mag Live. We're going to run down some top tech news for you, give a reader question, and show off one cool thing which may or may not already be in view. But first, we're going to talk about new ComScore data, which shows American smartphone usage information. It's, it's pretty interesting. 65.2% of America's now, Americans now all have smartphones. That's 156 million people. And among those uh, platforms, we've got Android topping with 51.8%, followed by Apple very close at 40.6%. That's a bit, little bit of a change from the previous round of data, Sasha, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit of a tweak. Apple's gained a little in the past three months. Uh, all the others slid a little. Uh, but I think what's interesting about the U.S. market share numbers, especially when you look at other countries, is that we have uh, Android at 51, Apple at 40, BlackBerry at 3.8, <laughs> uh, and Microsoft Windows Phone down at 3.3. And if you look at the U.S. versus other countries, the iPhone is much, much, much stronger here mm -hmm. than it is in a lot of other places, and Windows Phone is a lot weaker. We're seeing uh, a bunch of European countries where Windows Phone is well over 10%, but they cannot even break 4% here in the U.S. Yeah, in terms of uh, manufacturers, Apple was leading with 40.6%, followed by Samsung at 24.9%. So it's a really big... Uh, imbalance between the two big leaders. Well, no, I mean, in that case, you know, Apple Apple is the only maker of iPhones, mm -hmm. so they have all of that. And if you look at Android phones, that's fragmented. But once again, what's important to look at here is that Samsung's up at 25%, and then we have Motorola at 7%, LG basically at 7%, HTC sliding to 5%. So nobody is approaching Samsung in the Android marketplace. And, uh, you know, we're going to be seeing the Galaxy S5 probably coming out next month. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can Samsung maintain that lead, uh, that lead which is so huge in the U.S. between them and all the other Android manufacturers? Well, once again, you note that Microsoft is not very high in that list or even in that list at all. But Microsoft did do something pretty notable when they uh, gave $15 million to Foursquare to get a multi-year license to the company's location data. Now, Foursquare, of course, is the service where you can check in on your phone and you can earn badges and mayorships and break the hearts of people by showing off how often you go to uh, stores around the country. And this is pretty interesting because as Sasha pointed out, Foursquare, uh, Foursquare's biggest source of income right now is Microsoft. Yeah, I think this was this was a value play for Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, as we've been talking about, doesn't have a lot of mobile users right now. They need that data. Okay, their new CEO, Satya Nadella, he's kind of a big data guy. They want that location data of where people are. And Foursquare is this dying service. I mean, Foursquare was this fad of, what, 2010, 2009? Yeah, around there. Yeah, yeah, is this fad and, you know, they claim they have 45 million registered users, but who knows how many of those are active users. Um, they have a small core of people who like it, and it's not really spreading. I'm one of them, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, okay. But so, so Microsoft can probably get those users' data for a really affordable price. Um, when compared to generating its own data or, or going to other sources of data. So Microsoft, you know, wants that location data. Uh, they want it for Bing. They want it for mobile products. They want it for local search. Foursquare is desperate for money. So uh, Microsoft is kind of scooping this up uh, for an affordable rate. And what's interesting there, of course, is that we saw a lot of services like this uh, previously, uh, Facebook check-in, Google was doing the check-in thing, and now everyone's sort of giving it up because they're getting it from their uh, mobile users on various other apps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whatever, moving on. Um, Amazon Worlds, that is their fan fiction service, has added some new titles. You will soon be able to get G.I. Joe fan fiction. Uh, they have a deal with Hasbro where they can actually license the properties. Uh, authors will get a 35% cut, and then some will go off to Hasbro as well. So this is uh, great for you G.I. Joe fans out there. Now, what I think is interesting is that uh, now you talk about Hasbro making a deal with Amazon Worlds. Okay, Hasbro is clearly just dipping their toes in here because when you look at the Hasbro fan fiction universe, G.I. Joe is like third tier. Okay, what does Hasbro own that dominates the fan fiction landscape? I can't wait to hear it. My Little Pony Friendship oh, is Magic. Of course, of okay. course. And uh, they are clearly trying to figure out how to monetize that. Is Amazon going to be the way to do that? You know, uh, that's, that's clearly going in Hasbro's mind. And G.I. Joe is, is probably a tester for that Amazon relationship. Uh, but they also allow Veronica Mars fan fiction now mm -hmm. that's probably tied to the upcoming movie release. Uh, it joins these Amazon Worlds uh, deals for things like Gossip Girl and what I think most hilariously, the world of Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, a lot of, lot of fan fiction going on there. 
I really wonder how successful this whole Amazon Worlds thing is, though, because it is uh, very restrictive in terms of the kinds of content uh, with their uh, strict, uh, you know, overwhelming no porn policy. And if you look at the fan fiction landscape, okay, uh, is there fan fiction where people are not having sex? I mean, yes, but we, we can. We it's it, it's a big deal for that. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, Amazon, like, fan fiction is all about ultimate freedom, and it's about ultimate creative freedom. And there's already a, a fan fiction world out there. I don't know what Amazon is really adding other than, I mean, I guess potential revenue for people to sell their fan fiction uh, in exchange for these limitations. But are people really doing fan fiction for the money? I don't think so. I think they're doing it for the love. That's true, but there's a lot of hours that go into that love, and maybe it's time that they saw a little bit of cash for that? Maybe, maybe. maybe so in maybe. any case, G.I. Joe, Veronica Mars, have at it. Uh, absolutely. Well, we're going to move on now to our reader question. Uh, Healthy MBS one asks via YouTube, where do you see the pricing and contract and customer poaching wars between the big four wireless carrier leading to? Will they bottom out or keep adapting, adapting in 2014? This is obviously for you, Sasha. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited by what we've seen, uh, basically what we've seen T-Mobile starting. Uh, which is this awesome price and uh, and contract terms war in the in the mobile industry? It shows T-Mobile is a maverick. They should not be allowed to merge with Sprint. Uh, and uh, I love watching Wall Street run scared about lowering the massive. 50% profit margins that uh, some of the larger carriers are seeing right That's now. Incredible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, T-Mobile is going to keep cracking at it. Uh, Sprint is uh, Sprint is going to uh, participate in this as well, but I do think by the end of 2014 we are going to see a bit more stability, and I think there's going to be a lot less of the two-year contracts going on. There's going to be a move away from phone subsidies towards uh, payment plans for phones or upfront sales of phones, uh, and I think we're going to see lower rates all around except from Verizon. And I think Verizon is going to keep themselves positioned as the network quality carrier, the premium price, premium service carrier, uh, but below Verizon you're going to have AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint duking it out in this really exciting way that's really going to be great for U.S. consumers. Well, that's good news for everyone. Well, healthy MBS1, I hope, you, I hope that answered your question. And if you've got questions, be sure to ask them on Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, like this guy did, whatever you want. So let's move now to our one cool thing, which has been lurking in the background here the entire time. This is the LG 55 EA 9800 curved television. I don't know if you can see how curved it is, but it, it is in fact quite curved. Yeah, this old puppy is uh, currently uh, street price $8,500 at Best Buy, okay? And uh, its main advantage, it's curved. It's thin too, but yeah. it's mostly curved. It's extremely thin, it's very light. It is uh, the first TV we've tested that actually has an infinite contrast ratio in that the blacks are actually black. It's an OLED TV, uh, which very much helps in that. But it's $8,500. $500. And if you look at the user interface here, okay, this is clearly a last generation TV. LG did something very, very exciting with their TV line this year, which was they brought in Palm's WebOS. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have smart TVs that are running a true smart operating system and not the old proprietary, confusing, limited stuff that we see, for instance, on this, last year's TV. Um, so the review isn't up yet. Will Greenwald is still working on the review, but this really strikes me as, as kind of a tech demo of how to do a curved panel rather than anything that's going to really rock the marketplace this year. Well, that may be true, but it is, I was just watching you touch this thing. It is pretty amazing how it's so thin that you can actually bend it. It's, it's pretty incredible to look at. And in fact, we saw one TV at CES which flexed back and forth between being curved and flat. You can do it with these flexi panels. That's incredible. Well, if you've got uh, about 10 grand to burn, here's an opportunity to do so. And for the, everyone else, uh, thanks for watching PC Mag Live, and we'll see you tomorrow.